Welcome, everybody, uh, to this KCOR, Canadian Association, weekly talk on Zoom. Uh, we always have treats on this pa panel, and we're going to have another treat today. Uh, we, <laughs> we are all very aware of the consequences and uh, of climate change, uh, but Peter McKinnon is going to help us understand that there's much more than that that we need to pay attention to. So, Peter, thank you for being with us, and off you go, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, John, for the introduction, and uh, I'll just begin with the, the cover slide. Uh, this is a very dramatic uh, rendition of uh, what I wish to talk about in terms of what I call planetary limits, where the actual modeling approach that I'm going to talk about is called planetary boundaries. So I make the distinction between the research build, building the models, which is about boundaries, and my talk about limits in their co broader context. So, I mean, this is a pretty dystopian boundary, as you can see. So uh, obviously, I hope that it, at least there'll be a warning zone uh, that we're probably uh, going to talk about in this uh, next few minutes anyway, that's between the green and the tar and the, and the, uh, and the parched land. So uh, let's proceed. I have a few topics to cover. So uh, the setting of the stage is the preamble with that slide. I'm going to talk about the climate emergency declarations just to give a context that this is now a social initiative around the world at the level of community. Uh, we, of course, have got the precautionary principle, which I'm sure as Quake Corps members you're all familiar with, and its origins, in fact, in, in uh, 92. Uh, how we got to where we are, I'd like to uh, give us a sort of a million-year view, and uh, then uh, deal with uh, some of the uh, foundational issues that uh, b link between us as society and humanity and the world we live in, in the natural, natural sense. And then we'll look at these boundary models. These, ma these models, there's four different versions right now. The first model came out in 1990, uh, 2022, sorry, 2009, and the last model came out in 2022, and they're still evolving. And uh, we'll then deal with some conclusions. So that's the subject of the talk. And uh, I'd like to begin by pointing out that uh, the climate crisis uh, cannot be addressed as a standalone issue, the very point that John Holland just uh, made, uh, that it's part of a much larger complexity of nonlinear integrated uh, systems that we are now using the word polycrisis to describe. So this is now a new word in our vernacular, and it means a lot of problems uh, in an in environmental sense. And in effect, uh, that boils down to humans are on a collision course with the natural world. And I mean, we've all heard about this. So what I'm going to be talking about is not relatively new to your, to you as an audience at KCOR events, because these are often the things you talk about. But I'm going to try and integrate many of these things in a way that is now being cast as data-driven with scientific questions being posed to, uh, to build these models. So as a consequence, we're losing our resilience to deal with the stress and the disturbances that uh, we're press pressing on our planet. So the first uh, climate declaration was actually a local government in Australia in 2016. It was uh, Melbourne, the city of Melbourne. And since then, up until uh, I checked the data up until 2022, um, there was over um, 2,100 local governments in 39 countries had declared, declared climate emergencies. Um, I don't think Ottawa has declared one, and I can't recall if any Canadian cities have, but I believe several smaller Canadian cities have declared in this same program. Anyway, that's something to, uh, to consider. We maybe lobby Ottawa on. Uh, anyway, uh, in uh, 2021, uh, this uh, climate emergency declaration was updated, and uh, it had actually identified at th that time 31 integrated planetary vital signs that were covering all kinds of disciplines, and uh, many of these have uh, uh, as I've given some examples, I mean, greenhouse gases, temperature, rising sea levels, we hear about these sort of things all the time. But, uh, you know, the, the ocean heat content, uh, the Amazon rainforest loss rate, these sort of things, uh, we haven't met, got exact measures on all of, a lot of these things. So we're going to be exploring some of that boundary problems with measure. But many of these vital signs are incorporated into this new framework 
which uh, is called the planetary boundaries. So let's explore that. You'll see that almost all my slides have a web reference, and that's for a source. Um, the way I've structured this material is that there's two kinds of font size, big and little. Uh, the bigger is what I'll main, main point. The little is a, a additional uh, elaboration on the point. So here we go. Then another uh, declaration happened uh, in, uh, well, here's the original. I'm just going to move my, there we go. Uh, the World Scientist uh, Warning to Humanity was uh, actually the first one that was declared in 1992. It was 1,700 scientists signed it at the time. Almost every living Nobel laureate in any physical science was a, a signature to that uh, particular document. And you can see in red, which I won't repeat, uh, this is what that message said 30 years ago. And uh, what have we done to address it? in those 30 years? Well, we're starting to, but it's a very weak response to something that's been that dire 30 years ago. So here's some background to that very statement. We've definitely failed to make any serious progress, it seems, uh, on, on that uh, against that uh, framework of 92, uh, with one exception, <clears throat> and that is in a, a stratospheric ozone. The Montreal Protocol, that was a remarkable, quick decision-making, uh, science-based, globally accepted response to a recognized problem. We were creating what I will call um, toxic chemicals or uh, another thing, no uh, novelties, uh, which we'll get into in a few minutes, uh, that were exposing um, we're rising up into the atmosphere and moving towards the polar regions and causing a depletion of ozone, breaking down ozone, a, a molecular structure of oxygen. So that was rapidly dealt with. And uh, since uh, that is uh, ozone holes have been closing. In fact, it was uh, uh, polar scientists in the form of uh, meteorologists and perhaps a glaciologist or two from the British Antarctic Survey uh, and others in Britain who discovered the polar uh, in the hole in the ozone layer in Antarctica back some years ago. And uh, we've also been uh, known, as you've probably seen, even our museum uh, of uh, our, our, our art museum, the National Gallery had an uh, Anthropocene exhibit uh, not too long ago. And uh, so we hear this another term, uh, the Anthropocene, which is uh, kind of the human imposed control of our environment. And uh, the last extinction uh, that happened on any large scale, on a planetary scale, was about 540 million years ago. And that was the sixth in our geological record. And uh, we're now perhaps uh, moving into the seventh. Um, and I'll deal with uh, some of this in a bit when we look at biodiversity. So there's an, adva there's a, <clears throat> an advanced uh, advancement is urgently needed to ch in changing the environmental policies that humans do, uh, at, humans act in in order to uh, address these problems we're going to talk about. And again, the scientists warned a second time in 2017, uh, the same kind of warning as the, as the one that was issued uh, with the Nobel laureates. This time it's got over 17,000 signatures. Uh, it's the most that's ever been uh, signed up against a, a published uh, scientific paper. And again, in 2022, another warning. Um, and again, I, the message is pretty clear. We're jeopardizing the future. And uh, humanity is not taking the urgent steps needed to safeguard our imperiled biosphere. So the precautionary principle, something I know you will all be familiar with, so I need not go into any detail, but to point out in red that this is uh, you know, our first major international statement on dealing with the environment. In order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach shall be widely applied. And that is something that, that although we say it with words, uh, we don't do it in actions. If we look at, uh, for example, uh, Amazon deforestation, deforestation in many parts of Southeast Asia, uh, where there's no deforesting and not replanting, for example. So the precautionary principle sets a boundary or a stage for us to, to look at where we're going. So how do we get here? Well, here's a little bit of glaciology for you. <laughs> uh, here's the last million years in, in basically ice core data. And so this is uh, temperature variation uh, as interpreted by variations in the isotopic ratio of oxygen 18 versus oxygen 16, which are just isotopes of oxygen in, a water, in water. So the key points here are where the arrows are. 
And uh, the first of all, though, the Holocene, the stuff in red on the far right, this is where we've been living. This is where civilization emerged, is in this period. And you can see that before that, in terms of temperature, it really does look like a yo-yo up and down over almost a million years, in case, except for this rather stable period we've been in recently. The Pleistocene extends beyond uh, to the right, to the left, and it's about you know two million years in in in, in duration. So the first migrations from a uh, fully modern humans uh, happened uh, you know in that period about ninety thousand years ago, and uh, Aboriginals arrived in Australia about uh, 70,000 years ago, and uh, beginning of agriculture you know around uh, eleven seven thousand years ago, and uh, the net result is here we are we you know and even in the brief little wiggles of the Holocene. We had the great civilizations of Europe and Asia uh, that have come and gone. It, it's still only a little fraction of this little slice of time. And uh, climate, of course, is, uh, is the driver of that environment. And you can see it's oscillated dramatically in the past with nature doing the driving. And now we are unleashing stored energy of the past and are using it to heat ourselves uh, and our atmosphere to a point that we're now causing great distress. Get to the next one here. And let's, here's another, uh, this is contact settings uh, foil here. Uh, so we had inside the circle, a set of social foundations that are typical of our modern society. I'm not gonna analyze this and just to express it because we're gonna look at pictures in a few moments. And then we have this boundary of safety characterized in the color green. And so we have these foundations that are social, they're stable, political systems, for example. If we're always in, in, in turmoil, then we have a little bit limited uh, quality of life. And then there's the uh, an ecological ceiling to this environment we live in. And there's various ways we've divided that. And some of those you can see are on the outer, outer circle around that. And we'll explore these in more detail. I won't go into them here. But as we go outward, we go into overshoot. And as we go inward, we go into shortfall. This doesn't mean that the center is zero. It's not meant to represent uh, imagery in that sense. It's almost Lobachevskian, if you like. It's a kind of mathematics. So planetary boundary framework. Let's look at the, the structure of this framework. Um, it's, it's clear that we're dealing with roughly our, our turmoil has been in the last few centuries is what we've done to uh, recognize we disturb things. So we're now trying to uh, understand the stresses on our entire environment. So we have these things that are biophysical processes that determine the Earth's capacity for self-regulation. And if these are crossed, then there's an uh, unacceptable environmental change. At least we would characterize it as unacceptable because it's gonna tilt our environmental situation as we know it today. For example, uh, pre-industrial in, in the late, uh, say, 1800, uh, the number, the amount of carbon dioxide was around 285 parts per million. We're now over two. We're now over 417, and that's it, that's grown by about 30 parts in just the last 15 years. So I mean, we're we're on non-linear, uh, you know, rates of change, and these are now being sensitive to be measured. I mean, scientists were able with machinery and technical devices able to measure things in the past and the real changes, but now humanity can feel these changes in the increasing intensity of storms because there's more energy in the system. So these boundaries define the safe operating space for humanity, with respect to the Earth systems and our associated infrastructures of, of civilization, because we are so dependent on energy now, more so than ever, ever before, because we use energy for so many things. So crossing a planetary boundary comes at the risk of some type of an abrupt change. And we don't know what that change actually is because this is nonlinear and it's not just one system, it's a system of systems and they're all interacting. They're interacting on different time scales and at different physical scales, both in spatial and in, in, in depth, in the ocean, in the atmosphere. So it's very, very complex. And to the extent that these Earth system process, process boundaries have not been crossed, they are marked off in this model we're going to look at as safe zone. So it's the zones that we'll, we'll look into in a little more detail in a few moments. 
and transgressing one or more of these planetary boundaries may be disastrous or even catastrophic due to the risk of crossing these thresholds. So as I mentioned, I call these uh, planetary limits. The models call them planetary boundaries. And some people refer to these as tipping points. So those words are more or less interchangeable. And one of the things, of course, some of you well know is that the different disciplines, whether it's the physical sciences, biological sciences, and so on, we all have our lingo, uh, even our own mathematical symbols for the, exactly the same equations. But we have expressed a physicist will use it differently than an engineer, for example. So getting to have a common language of understanding when we're dealing with such complexity as these multiple dimensions uh, of uh, fields of research and understanding is, is itself uh, a major activity. So here are the nine boundaries that are currently identified uh, as in the models. There's been some added since this first model. But uh, I was to say, as I say, climate change is principally the driver of many of these. And you can almost see those by your own uh, linkage. For example, climate change is warming. So with warming of the atmosphere, we're warming the oceans. The oceans are in warming the atmosphere, we're adding more carbon dioxide. With mixing with rain, it causes carbolic acid, which mixes in the ocean, which causes acid in the, in the oceans, which causes things with carbonic shells to dissolve. So I mean, there's a link between climate change and, and acidification of the oceans and then biodiversity in the oceans. There's just a simple example. Uh, land use, uh, you know, we've been massive uh, reuse of uh, reshaping of land. And in some parts of the world, like India, China, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, they've been using the same land for millennia. And so the nutrient of these uh, areas has been, has been depleted over what it has been in the past. And so we uh, have a fertilizer issue and we make fertilizer, but fertilizer has a, a, a polluting effect if it gets into the wrong places, like the general water supply. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments as well. So here are the characters of each of these planetary boundaries. I've just put these there for your edification. This is designed to read after the fact, if you wish. Uh, so I won't, I won't explain them here, but this is their sort of background definitions. The one that's uh, more interesting and has a, a, a name that's somewhat unusual is this uh, novel entities. The novel entities are toxic substances. They could be toxic chemicals. They could be nanoparticles that are into the system of, of like plas nanoplastics uh, in, in biosystems. These are called novel entities. That's a, that's a new term here. So there's some now some constraining consumptions to uh, what we're about to do. So the exact values that are chosen as boundaries are somewhat arbitrary. And a good example is like, what should be the CO2 concentration level to be a, ameliorate our climate? Uh, 218 was what I mentioned, uh, 285 was what I mentioned be pre-industrial, whereas it says uh, 214, 217 here. Um, so is that too high? Is that too low? We don't know. Uh, so there's the, that's what I mean by some of these boundaries don't have yet a boundary number on them. They're, they're, they're very much a, a fluid thing. Uh, then the integrity of the biosphere is, is a highly uh, dependent on uh, climate environments and uh, the emergent level of phenomena that are connected to all these. Um, so the operating uh, at the level of the whole Earth systems has uh, co-evolved for nearly 4 billion years in terms of uh, the, the, what we've inherited. But what we've inherited is now something we're actually changing at a very rapid rate, much ra more rapid than it ever did in, in the evolution of nature. And boundaries can vary globally. And I'll, I'll show you that in a few moments uh, in, in, a, in a form of a table. And uh, the assignment of acceptable limits to these processes that ultimately determine our own survival is is risky in other ways as well. So this, this is a social science application to science as well. And so uh, this is, I think, a good thing that we're starting to see this kind of coming together. And so some limits may be easier to balance with ethical and economic issues. And uh, you know, fertilizer is a good example of that. We need fertilizer because we've depleted the soils for, for food, yet we now have a runoff that takes the, those phosphates uh, and, and into, the, into the water system, which is causing now serious environmental pollution 
and at low levels in many areas, but nonetheless, it's not natural to be there. So how do we balance between the social value of the need for growing food and the and ethical need to improve the environment? There's good questions to, uh, to consider. The same issues with, with carbon in the oceans. Now, not all processes are, uh, or subsystems have well-defined thresholds either. So uh, human action uh, uh, undermines the resilience of some of these processes when we're not even quite sure where the boundaries are. And planetary boundaries are values for control variables. So all of these um, topics, each, each theme, there are some control variables. So for example, in the case of climate change, the control variable is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as measured in parts per million at a certain temperature, et cetera, pressure. So that, that, these are the kinds of, they've got indicators for all these, uh, or, or I should call them um, uh, these uh, factors for, for each of these uh, nine layers. So here's an example of these planetary boundaries on different scales. So across the top, we have three col we have uh, three rows, sorry, three columns, uh, the boundary character, and the scale of the process, and, the, and uh, then the processes is in terms of are they global or are, and uh, at sort of a speed, and then there's low, slow changing processes at scales that may be global, but we don't know. So you can see we have sy systemic system processes at planetary scale, like climate change, ocean acidification, atmospheric, uh, you know, ocean circulation, that sort of thing. Uh, we have stratospheric ozone is more processed around the polar regions, so it's more regional. Uh, we have aggregated processes that range from local to regional scale. And you can see that we're trying to understand how much of it spills over into the, into the full global environment. Again, references there to this work. So here's a first a cut at uh, these planetary boundary models. Uh, this is not to... Uh, analyze each of these sections, but it's to understand the color coding system here. So green, as I've mentioned before, is sort of thought of as, as safe. So green indicates safe. Um, orange uh, indicates um, basically uh, danger. It's gone beyond a boundary. And you can see there's an effort to uh, define a, an external boundary, which is that big, like the donut we had in the, in the first slide of donuts. Um, that uh, there's the inside part that's safe and the outside part that's uh, that's unpredictable and, and likely to be dangerous as, as something for human society to operate in. Like temperatures in, in wet wet bulb temperature, for example, in India last summer with the hot the heat wave, there were temperatures that were at the wet bulb level for days at a time, and this type of temperature humans can't survive in because your your body is giving off. More you're, you're, the heat that is around you is more than your body can absorb and give off. It's a really serious problems are going to be emerging in some of these areas in the coming coming years. So anyway, that you've had a chance to read these what these green and orange things are. So now we can look at these in another different way. Uh, in effect, it's been refined. The model now has a zone. We'll call it the yellow zone here. We've now added a, a transition zone from it's safe. We're now in a transition zone. We're going to go into the red if we don't do something about it. So you can see how these have been characterized just by uh, the color coding here. And as you can tell, some of these boundaries, uh, uh, fields have not yet been quantified to be fed into the model, but have been identified as something that should be in this kind of model because there's inter interrelationships. So here's the first boundary. <clears throat> here's the first model in 2009. And um, there's a few artificial things here. For example, a map of the globe uh, that doesn't really represent anything. Uh, so that's been dropped uh, in later models. But uh, nonetheless, it's uh, a characterization of implying the planet uh, has, has these issues. So the wed regions represent the estimate of current position for each. And in, back in uh, 2009, you can see there were four zone, three zones that uh, were actually uh, in the planetary boundary uh, over over the limit as they saw it at that time. And just to give some context to these, uh, uh, both uh, the uh, uh, control variables, for example, uh, I add these, simply point these out because they may not be common to your knowledge. 
but um, stratospheric ozone is measured in something called Dobson units. And so it's uh, simply the amount of ozone over your head at any geographic place on the planet. And, that's the, and, the, and the number of units is Dobson, and, and it's a measure. So you can see the boundary number for there is, is showing. We've got it also for carbon dioxide, which is the one, as I mentioned, is used for, for the planetary boundary for climate change. So novel entities, these are chemical pollutants and um, microparticles of different sorts. And uh, th these were introduced in 2015 as an aggregate to a variety of other chemical things and toxins that were being discussed. Now they're lumped together as, as, as this novel entities. And novel because we've created them. They're not available in nature. I mean, yes, they're made from natural materials, uh, atoms and mo molecules, but we've, we've created these uh, particular designs. So this boundary refers to entities that are novel in a geological sense, just like what I was saying, and, and also on the scale. They're now at a scale that is polluting. So it's not just a, a local dump. And uh, this is just further details on what is comp composed of novel entities. And now we're going to look at quickly uh, just uh, how they uh, assess uh, these these and the control variables for each of these novel entities. So each of the each novel entity, which is one of many in this whole family of things, has a process we're going to go through like this. So there's a need to understand its relevance, its feasibility to address, and how comprehensive we are about addressing it. And this is just explained in the textual material on the right side there. And this is applying to the novel entities process. But uh, it could be done to to any 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 and all of these different boundaries. Um, by the way, this uh, thing that looks sort of like a whale uh, was in the diagram. I couldn't remove, so it has no particular uh, uh, value to this other than being an artistic uh, interpretation. Also, uh, each of these uh, entities that we're dealing with, each of the boundaries we're dealing with has some kind of measures, as I, I, was, I was saying. So this is an example of looking at a generalized impact pathway for novel entities. So we have the domain, which is either technological or environmental. We have an impact pathway, and we have the control variables that look at how we're going to measure things along that impact pathway. And you can see there's a, a linear flow here that uh, illustrates a, a, a process that uh, can allow us to address uh, in a systematic way, uh, ways and means of addressing these different problems. There's no feedback loops that are linked into this at this time. So there's still evolving uh, framework for this, uh, as I say, a work in progress. Uh, there's been uh, some proposal to add a new boundary called uh, green water. Uh, there's also, uh, a new measure that's been introduced and it's called the root zone soil moisture. Like the Dobson unit, it's all the you know, ozone above you. Uh, the root zone soil moisture is the amount of moisture at two meters depth anywhere in the world on a, on a surface, on a, on a land surface. So at two meters depth, you get your root zone mo soil moisture. So these are standard measures that are good to have because they allow us to compare things across across different uh, regions of the world and over different time scales if we have used the same measurements. So the planetary boundary model that came out in 2015, which is when they introduced uh, novel entities, um, this, is the, this is the picture. You can see that there are uh, four boundaries that are, uh, or five, I guess we can say, uh, the climate change is in the, in the, in the warning zone. So it's not in the red. So there are three in the red zone, so to speak. Uh, and that's in biodiversity and uh, biochemicals and uh, the uh, land use systems are also getting stressed out. They're moving towards uh, the, the limit as well. So this, this is the first effort to, uh, it was published uh, by uh, uh, the Stockholm Resilience uh, Center at Stockholm University in uh, Nature Magazine. Um, and uh, that was uh, back in uh, the early or mid mid 2020s, uh, mid uh, I guess we say 2020s, 2010s. 
And uh, here's another model that came from the, the Finnish Environmental Institute. So this uh, work started in Scandinavia, this building of these planetary boundary models. And uh, this is another example, just to show you that there's other work going on elsewhere, and it's con convening the same kinds of ideas. They still have the, the background map of the world, uh, but that uh, that's uh, disappearing as we go forward. Uh, so here's the framework as we see it today. The boundaries are based on existing data. The climate boundary is being forced by anthropogenic climate change, human modification, of the, uh, the planetary nitrogen cycle is now at a point where it's starting to cross the boundary, and that's due primarily because of our use of fertilizers. Ocean acidification is rapidly approaching its threshold uh, based on absorption of carbon dioxide into the ocean, uh, ocean water to create a weak acid that is dissolving carbonaceous uh, um, life forms, because coral reefs, of course, among those. And uh, then in that uh, a year ago, well, just over a year ago, uh, scientists concluded in an environmental science and technology magazine, as a, a technical journal, that humanity has exceeded a planetary boundary related to environmental pollutants and other novel entities. So this is where the novel entities uh, became a part of the literature. So only in the past year. And then uh, in April, uh, also uh, a little more, a little less than a year ago, the boundary for fresh water uh, was uh, being reassessed to include green water, and green water being water that comes with rain, and uh, snow would melt uh, as, as, and become seasonal, uh, become runoff. So now let's look at the biodiversity picture. This is not looking good. Um, you can see the characterization uh, of the type of sort of life form, whether it's plant or animal, like on the, on the right of the character. Uh, the color scheme is obvious. Red is danger, blue is safe. Uh, you can see the type of uh, life forms down on the left column. And uh, you have a link uh, with a reference to uh, each of these footnotes that go with uh, each of the uh, points that are raised here. You can see that 50... Now, what we don't know is what is an acceptable extinction rate. I mean, we know that life has come and cycled in the Earth's history, and that the last extinction was about 90% of life forms disappeared. Now, that's life forms we can measure, so that doesn't include microbes and viruses and so on. We don't, don't count those in at that point. But here, we're still talking about, let's call it macro living systems. And uh, you can see it, 50% already, much of the world's living systems are in the red zone or very seriously uh, approaching it. So we're, we're really in it. The COP20, the COP15 that happened in Montreal just a few weeks ago um, was an interesting uh, development because, in fact, that meeting was originally scheduled to be in, in Wuhan, in China. But because uh, China had its lockdown, Canada agreed to host the meeting in partnership with China. So the co-host was Canada and, uh, and China for that particular meeting on biodiversity. And out of that, I'm hoping that we'll see some collaborations between China and Canada in dealing with biodiversity and others because of the outcome of that, that particular meeting. So you can see our life form in the planet Earth is under serious threat. And uh, of course, we're part of that. Uh, and we depend on the food chain. And there's now some serious issues in terms of breaking down the food chain, especially in the oceans. We're over at least 40% of life forms that we knew in 1950 are no longer in the ocean. So latest assessments. We're now up to six boundaries are, beyond, are, are at their safety limit or near their safety limit. And uh, in protecting nature, we're dealing with land, biodiversity, fresh water, the nutrients that are needed for uh, life forms. And uh, I don't think we're gonna meet this 1.5 degree threshold. I'm more likely it's going to be two to three degrees, and that will be serious displacement of some parts of the world where they'll be drying out and, uh, and excessive heat or changing in t terms of excessive moisture. So to stop and reverse climate change requires massive action on both decarbonizing and the global energy system and tackling ecological overshoot, among other tasks. And these are the kinds of messages as KCOR members you've been hearing from various speakers uh, over time here. And here's the last uh, version of the model that came out uh, last year. And uh, it's similar to what I've been talking about. It's just you got more stuff in the orangey red zones. And you can see that uh, 
it's starting to get filled out in a way that is causing us to scratch our heads and say, for those who are optimistic, we can do it with something about this. And those who are pessimistic, they maybe say, why we got, why bother? So maybe that'll be a topic for discussion as we move forward here. So let's link this now to uh, something else, the UN Sustainability Development Goals. These are the uh, stratification of the goals into three layers, the biospheric goals, those are related to society and those are related to economy, sort of like that donut we had at the beginning where there was a bio component, a societal and a, a human dimensions. So you can see most of these, 17 goals. So most of these goals fit into, the, into this uh, mapping of these planetary boundaries. Now it's gonna get a little more complicated as we look at the next step, because we have here by example, and this is just an example out of a paper cited there, here are the planetary, the, 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 goal, the goals on the SDGs, uh, and then the actual uh, impact category, and then where do they fit in different areas along the top uh, with respect to these zones. And you can see that they're starting to build a pattern. Now it's harder to see the pattern in reality until you look at it in maybe a more uh, image fashion, but it gets complicated. So we have a view here, which is kind of extending the last slide into a graphical form and then mapping that into the planetary boundaries model. And uh, you can see that uh, these things do interrelate. And uh, th this therefore makes it possible for us to break it down and, and understand it and deal with it and build it back up again in ways that have been traditional uh, how we've advanced our knowledge. And uh, the latest models, uh, as I was saying, uh, have uh, these type of risk issues. Uh, and uh, I need not repeat myself because it's the same sort of story each time we go through these models. But uh, now we're uh, dealing with uh, the latest and uh, the yellow zones are basically have been introduced as uh, safety zones for policy people. The science community sort of said, well, you know, we're in the safe zone and it's not like the tree and, and the grass and the desert on my first slide. It doesn't transition as quick as that. It's going to be a, a transition zone. So now we have built in this zone uh, of transition and uh, it's somewhat arbitrary. You can see this is at full scale because it's obviously gone into the red zone. This is an arbitrary boundary because uh, arbitrary within it where it is, it's an estimate, but it hasn't reached its, its, uh, its full scale yet. So this is still all a bit of jigsaw puzzle building here. And uh, I challenge people to take an interest in looking into this and maybe even contributing to it as it evolves. So in conclusion, the concept of planetary boundaries or limits is a framework for viewing and assessing the vast range of nature and man-made uh, man and human-induced uh, changes to our perturbation of our planetary systems. And the current planetary boundary has a say, planetary framework has these nine themes, more are likely to be added. Uh, some have been combined in, in the past uh, with the novelty entity, novel entities as an example. Uh, planetary boundary um, approach maps to most of the UN sustainability development goals, where there's a few that are not, uh, they're outside the, uh, they're not relevant. And we must recognize in our day-to-day -day lives and in our governing institutions that Earth with all its life is our only home. And this is the place we're talking about, and it's got a huge amount of challenges before us. I provide a bibliography, and thank you very much, Messi. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions um, here, I'm pleased to say. And the first one, in fact, there are three questions from William Rees. So, uh, William, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, now I forget what my question was, but I'll try to find it here. Well, I, I could remind you if you want. Okay, yeah, Peter, I just wondered, you emphasized the um, destruction of the Amazon or these tropical forests. And I think we tend to uh, forget that we have deforested much of Canada. BC, for example, had the greatest rainforest on earth. And we've depleted them to the point where the forest sector is in now serious trouble and in fact shutting down. Uh, there's more carbon per hectare in our west coast rainforest than in tropical forests that's true 
we haven't even begun to consider the damage we've done to the boreal forest, which is now a net source of carbon uh, for that reason. Anyway, uh, the real question is, isn't the driver of all of the uh, so-called indicators in your models here that are so well known, uh, aren't they all driven by simple overshoot? There's too many people consuming and polluting too much. And to the extent that these models are out there, I think they're a distraction from the real problem, which is, is overshoot. We focus on these symptoms, none of which can be solved in isolation. I think you made that point very well, but nobody's fingering the real problem, which is just too damn many people consuming too darn much stuff and polluting everything in the process from the atmosphere to the oceans and, and the soils. Well, I, 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 I take your point. Um, I'm of the view that the human population is about as much as the capacity the planet can handle. Uh, and I think our population is by its own nature, our, our, our own system, because of rise in education and other, other factors, is going to plateau in the, before the middle of this century. Um, the issue of, of uh, consumption is, is something that is way beyond the topic here, but it's an issue, it's part of the topic. Um, I think the business model of the way we work, operate in the world is not right. I mean, it's <laughs> always consume, consume, consume. Why can't we be in some kind of balance? So if we were to be in some kind of balance, like native communities have traditionally been, then we wouldn't have these big issues that we're dealing with today. So, it, it, and maybe the population would have only grown at a different rate, uh, but we didn't do that. We took a different approach and built up this consumption model. So I, it's that I think is the driver, is the fact the consumption model. <laughs> yeah, but, but people are the consumers. Yeah, and people are the consumers. And of course, they're the, we've invented marketing and, and sales to, to make consumers appreciate why they need these things. Yeah, but we can show, and we have done in recent publications that, in every income category, it's it's the increase in population that is the principal driver of increased consumption today. So we can't separate these two things. And I think population is still a taboo subject. I've been accused of being a neo-fascist and an eco-racist and God knows what else. But if you don't look at this from the population perspective, and by the way, if population control would work best in the first world because one a Canadian is the equivalent of 15 East Indians or 20 Bangladeshis or whatever it might be. So, so it's a huge issue that we cannot leave off the table. That's all I'm arguing. End of story. Agree. You can't leave it off the table. It's, it's a summary it's, of it's, thought. Um, I just might stress, as Mike Nickerson pointed out, and it's, uh, I guess, one of his uh, his bylines, but uh, to play to the, my, my point, more fun, less stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll come back and remind you what one of your other thoughts was, uh, Bill Reese. Uh, please, may we have uh, Peter Bukowski, and I did, neglected to alert you when I invited uh, uh, Bill to take the floor. And following Peter, <laughs> I'll be going to uh, Dieter Meissner. So, uh, Peter, who will be talking to us uh, just with audio. I know someone who's always ready. John Meyer, are you, can you come up with your question very quickly? Oh, maybe they, they can't possibly have fallen. Ah, here we go. No. Oh. John, we can't hear you. you. You can't hear me. Oh, sorry. No, no, I hear you. Sorry, John, I, I can't hear John Meyer. Oh, yes, okay. Um, that makes two of us and probably everybody else. Would somebody who's actually ready to quickly get online uh, uh, do that, please? I, I, and any one of you who've asked, uh, 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 10 people or so have asked uh, a question. Richard? Uh, Andrew Welch is up. Perhaps I can follow on what Bill was talking about since that was my Thank comment. Thank you. Go, go for it. Sure. Um, so one of the early points uh, that you had that, that really resonated with me very strongly was this idea that solving climate change in isolation is not going to correct the poly crisis that we face. Uh, we've got both planetary boundaries and, and socioeconomic boundaries being the, the inner and outer parts of the donut. Um, and, and you uh, allude to the poor choices that we appear to have made over the last 70 years at least. 
And we tend to focus on how we might fix the poly crisis. My, my personal interest is asking why we got here in the first place, what led us to this place. And as will sound like a broken record to many of you now, my, my personal belief is that we live under this idea that more is always better, something that you don't find in the indigenous cultures, et cetera. So um, changing that kind of very basic value system is non-trivial. And the point I made in the chat was, which I'd like to uh, hear some thoughts back on is, nature has always addressed overpopulation by providing negative feedback. That's every population is designed to go over uh, and nature just pulls it back. Um, that, that's the way life is programmed is to keep procreating. So what are the chances that uh, the poly crisis, uh, including climate change is actually that negative feedback that nature is applying to the human species? That's, that's a very interesting question when it, it put in that context because it's quite philosophical in, in the sense that we are causing it, we are nature, and we are self-destructing ourselves, where in the past other life forms have been self-destructed, not by themselves, but because of the environment around them. So well, rabbits will self-destruct by eating their food source, right? That's the same kind of idea. They yeah, just but they eat. didn't destroy their environment. Uh, Fair enough. As Fair we enough. are, in effect, destroying our environment. So I, I find that rather interesting. I mean, it also is like it's like the cyborg. If you think about the future of AI, I mean, are we just simply a piece of, you know, uh, uh, meat mo meat machines that are going to be part of you know machines that are part metal and part meat? <laughs> You know, I mean, so heaven only knows it's, it's a very, you know, that's a dystopian thing. But the, the point you raise is also, a, you know, a, is it is it a Malthusian or is it, a, you know, Mignana? <laughs> I mean, we don't know. But I, I definitely agree uh, that, uh, you know, this this that's my, my very point in my last comments about, about, you know, more fun, less less stuff. And if I, could... I guess what, what I was leading to was the idea that uh, the other part of that question of, of uh, the polyclysis being a, a negative feedback is that if we were to somehow technically solve these problems without solving the, the, the basis that got us there, the more is always better or overpopulation, whatever it is, we're not really solving the problem. Um, so the polycrisis is in fact part of the solution. If I, if I could... well, in actual fact, I mean, we're talking now about mining the ocean floor, which is something we haven't done much of in the past. We're talking about mining asteroids. We're talking about mining the moon. So we're still talking about <laughs> more stuff. So the inherent model hasn't changed. It's built right in. Even our exploration to space is let's go find stuff. Thanks now, very much. Stephen Hawking, of course, made an interesting comment that I'm sure you've all heard. And that was that, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for when you're doing the, like SETI projects. <laughs> so, you know, we're also got a beacon out there. I mean, we now have a bubble around us, 100 light years in diameter, or 200 light years in diameter. Uh, that's radio waves, electromagnetic energy beaming out of this little spot near a, a star. And uh, maybe the aliens will come and take care of us. Good food here. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be flippant, it's a very serious subject. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, John Holland. Uh, no, uh, uh, Richard, uh, Richard van der Gatt, uh, are you uh, able to uh, join in, please? Yes, I am. I'm here. Good. Thank and you. I, I'm, there's, I'm like, there's, a, like... there's a glitch in our system, I, I find. I can only reach uh, maybe half the people directly. Please go ahead, Richard. Well, thank you. I, I guess my question really is a follow on to the previous question is really, I mean, you need to think about what about in our in the ca Canadian situation, we're talking about bringing in 500,000 people every year. And we're already heading towards overshoot. And what is that going to do towards our climate and so forth? We, on the one hand, it's good for economy. But on the other hand, you're dealing with overshoot. And how would you see that situation balancing out? Well, Richard, that's a, a very good question. In, in the broader context, um, I, I've been involved with several colleagues and we've been writing a paper on what we're anticipating is uh, a new class of uh, immigration. 
He's a cl- or new class of refugee. And he's, he's calling them climate refugees. I mean, this is already a term that you're starting to see in social science papers. We're anticipating, this small group of us are anticipating up to 100 million people trying to get into Canada by the end of the yeah. year. So, I mean, five, 500,000 a year. <laughs> I mean, yes, in over 10 years, that's, you know, uh, 5 million people. Uh, but, um, you know, the people who are looking at our immigration policy are not studying planetary boundary theory. <laughs> So with the left hand and the right hand are going to be disconnected, I'm sure, for some time to come when we could cause some more higher consumption in Canada uh, when that's maybe what we don't need. But we do need employment. We do need, sorry, we'll need a workforce because of the aging of our of our, our demographics. So, you know, there's, there's a number, again, of balancing acts going on just in social policy, independent of the climate change and what it's driving. So, so there's my answer. It's 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 a very difficult question to answer. Yeah, yeah. I've got another difficult question, uh, Peter. Um, the decisions on uh, on uh, on immigration are made by our parliament. Uh, how can your message be got through to parliamentarians? At, all three levels of government in this country? Well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a good question and an excellent challenge. There are some ways. Some are formal, some are informal. Uh, let me start at the municipal level. Um, for example, as I pointed out, Melbourne, Australia declared a climate emergency. That was at the municipal level, and many many cities around the world have followed. So there's an example of mayors and their their uh, councils uh, deciding that there's an issue they have to deal with, and they're making climate change adaptation uh, adaptation plans and things of that sort. Um, another thing at the municipal level, specifically in Canada, is there's an organization called the Canadian Federation Canadian Fe- Canadian Federation of Municipalities. And it is um, represents about ninety seven percent of communities in Canada. And that organization has a fairly significant program in dealing with climate climate adaption and adaptation. And it has run the Municipal Green Fund, which is funded by the federal government through Finance Canada. And that has now dispensed several billion dollars over the lifetime of this fund. And it's been very beneficial to many communities in Canada. And it continues. And now they're, they're running major programs in municipal asset management in terms of getting a handle on all the assets of a community as you start to start to link the communities and you know silos of the city, the, the, the garbage, the police, the fire, the tax people. I mean, they're all separate, but in an integrated city of smart cities, these are all gonna be sharing common data and common things. So you need to have an understanding of what assets you have. So they're doing things like that. Thank you, Richard. So that's, and then at, the, then at the provincial level, uh, well, of course, uh, provincial state level, we, we see as North America using U.S. and Canada's example here, very wide diversity of views because of the political point of view. So there's either it's a real or it's not real. Uh, that's a, basically it, it's it's not it's maybe it's it's either real or it's not real. Uh, so that's it. the people who are the not real uh, are the ones I'm most concerned about because uh, they are the deniers of change and um, they tend to be the ones who uh, wear a small C uh, on their uh, lapel for whatever conservative cause they represent. And um, those are the ones who have to be educated in some way. Uh, as in the case of the federal level, um, one possible way, uh, but it's a, one of these informal ways, is through the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering. <clears throat> this was established in 1995 by Howard Alper and uh, several others. Uh, Howard Alper was uh, the uh, former uh, vice president of research at the University of Ottawa, who became the um, the sort of the head of an, an, a science advisory panel to the prime minister. And uh, in the process, um, uh, before we created our, our science advisor. So um, this organization's remit, uh, some of you may be aware of uh, uh, an event that's held in Ottawa. So it's only a face-to-face thing, so it hasn't happened in the last three years. But an event that is held in Ottawa is going to start again in the spring is the Bacon and Eggheads Breakfast Club. It's a strange name, uh, but those of you who know it will relate to it. 
Uh, of course, the uh, eggheads are the scientists, the white coat and pens in their pocket. And the eggs is, of course, they eat bacon and eggs for breakfast and uh, sausages. So we meet at the, at the behest of the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the, of the Senate as, this, as the sponsors of this group. And we have a, a keynote speaker who talks about some science and engineering or science or engineering issue <clears throat> that we, the community in science and engineering, think that parliamentarians are going to have to make laws, rules, regulations, and understand in their future. And maybe even in the future of the house that they're sitting in. So they get an opportunity to have an impartial um, conversation about these topics. Thank you. Uh, it's Richard... just examples of some, and there's many others to answer Thank the you. question about three levels of government. Yes, indeed. It's a complicated country we live in, in many respects. Uh, Richard, please, will you take the floor? And well, thank you. I, I'll go to John Legg. I have a very quick question, a very quick comment, actually, and that is, I think as a KCOR, we need to think about what message we would want to bring to government on terms of uh, overshoot immigration policy and the environmental issues. And then I have a book, actually, that's called, it's, it's called Taking It to the Hill. It actually tells you it actually gives you advice on uh, from a, someone I know who has actually taken many messages to the Hill. And he wrote a book on how it's best to approach government and get the message through. So you're not just talking uh, to a blind wall, you're actually getting your message through and getting action on it. So that I highly recommend. I've got two copies of the book actually, but uh, I would highly recommend that we, we decide what we want, what message as KCOR we want to bring to the hill and then after reading the book take it to the hill thank you uh, john leg please uh thanks uh, john and uh, peter uh wow that's a lot you've covered a lot an awful lot and uh i don't want to cheat by going into commenting but there have been some very very good questions put to you and I would, uh, in the non-recorded section, come back to Richard uh, Richard Van. How do you pronounce your last the last part of your name, Richard? Anyway, it's uh, Vanderjack. It's just the way it's spelled. Actually, in Dutch, we would say Van der Jacht, but no one can ever say that. So I just <laughs> anglicize it and say Vanderjack. Vanderjack. Okay, I would like to come back to your uh, question. Uh, a little bit because I found, as I think uh, Bill Reese did, the uh, vastness of all the, the different uh, areas you have covered. I uh, would like to know uh, a little bit more about the one only uh, ocean acidification. Now, you, I think in that part, uh, the last mention of it, I think you did mention that there could well be linear, non-linear, in other words, uh, very serious changes coming up. And I have never heard anyone expound on what those might be. If you could please enlighten me and others about, about uh, ocean acidification, Peter. Thank you, John. Yes, certainly I'd be pleased to provide it. And it's a very simple answer, to be honest. Um, I keep referring to there's more energy in the system. Uh, this is what you know, the burning of fossil fuels is doing. It's putting energy, heat into the system, our planetary system. So that's the atmosphere, the earth, for that matter, as well as, uh, of course, the oceans. So in the, in the case of acidification, what's happening with more energy in the system we're putting because of more carbon dioxide and other trace gases, but CO two is the is the active agent here for the oceans. It's primarily, I mean, there's nitri nitrous nitrous uh, compounds too that can cause acidity, but they're they're trace compared to uh, CO the ca carbon. So what's happening with the rising temperature, which is rising nonlinearly? So that, in other words, it's increasing, it's accelerating. In other words. Um, 
but I mean, still a small scale, but it's still accelerating. And given the scale of the ocean and a lot of ocean water, it's, it's turnover. And so the amount of cons amount of absorption is gigantic that the, the ocean could absorb carbon dioxide into its water mass. And as it does so, some of that carbon dioxide gets converted into carbonic acid, which gives it, it's a weak acid, as I'm sure you're well aware of from high school chemistry. And that acid can dissolve carbonaceous materials. And the most common carbonaceous material, which is identified on one of my slides, um, is what most uh, shells are made out of that live in the oceans of animals. And so their shells are thinning. So they're die they will die by, by their shell disappearing. Okay, that's pretty And then we're also seeing the acidification. And what we mean by, I mean, water, the stuff we typically drink, it's, it's got a, a, a measure we call pH. Uh, pH is a measure of acidity or the basic base, a base. Uh, water is used as a standard and it's measured as zero as seven. So anything that's less than seven is on the acid side. Anything that's on the other side is on the base side. And it's this acid is, it, we're now about 5.7 in the ocean. And if we get to five, I mean, there'd be, you know, species will be disappearing, not just, you know, a particular area of where they might have lived. So we're already seeing in the oceans, both at the level of, of you know, clams, <laughs> as well as those who can migrate much easier, that they, animals are moving to different, lo different loca locations in their traditional habitats because of the warming waters. Good. Very useful. Thank you. Over to uh, you, John Holland. Yes, it's over. To, uh, Brian Check, could you uh, take the floor, please? Could you speak? No luck. I'm having a real struggle with the uh, system this afternoon. Um, Lynn Oliphant. Sure. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, go. I, I didn't actually have a question, but I suppose I. I could ask oh. one though. <laughs> well, that's uh, Peter, very nice uh, of you. You know, early on, I think in your first few slides, you described how, uh, with the methodology, the planetary limit was was reached when what was the phrase again? Uh, catastrophic uh, results would you know hit us. Um, paraphrasing, obviously, but so how did they, in each case? determine what constituted whatever the actual freeze was. Let's say it was catastrophic catastrophe or whatever. Well, the, the data that supports the claims uh, to be able to color the maps, if I can call those maps or charts, um, the it's, it's based on data. So uh, data is collected because it's, in, it's nature data. Uh, it, it, it's collected from thousands of different places in all kinds of types of data. So ocean data, atmospheric data, um, you know, soil data. This is vast quantities of data involved here, sort of like a, you know, the massive amounts of data for training AI systems. So the data has been collected and we understand some patterns. And this is a, this, this, you know, you have all this data and you I use this as a metaphor. You sit and you look at the spreadsheet of all this data, a three-dimensional spreadsheet. You, it's hard for the human head, mind to see patterns in that. But if we can take that data and put it into imagery, and even imagery we can slice and, you know, move around, then we can start to think about it in a different way. So this is a collection of data to try and create these kind of patterns in this form of the planetary boundaries to help us try and understand what's actually going on, what's interconnected. And then we can drill into the data and see through the patterns in the data and the mathematics of the physics and chemistry that we understand how these things actually interact. Yeah. And it's like a monumental tens of thousands of people project. Thank you, Brian. Uh, most organizations, when they run a talk like this, uh, ask for questions. Uh, KCOR is a little different in this respect as well. We're looking for a conversation. Questions are welcome. But if you've got a point you want like to make, 
please do that. So with that, I will turn to Lynn Oliphant, if she could join us now, please. Yes, uh, uh, I'm of the male sex, but uh, that's, that's understandable. Uh, Peter, I mean, uh, you made a good point that we're reaching boundaries, if not exceeding them uh, daily, uh, and, and it's not a pretty picture. We're definitely uh, uh, a species in overshoot, as William Reese uh, uh, continually reminds us. Uh, the, the point I'd like to make is, is how we got here. And, and to my mind, that's even as a scientist myself, uh, through science and technology. Without science and technology, uh, we would not be in this overshoot. If, uh, if as far as we got with science and technology was uh, 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 burning uh, wood and, uh, and having sharp sticks, uh, our population would never have reached billions and uh, we never would have created the electric and internal combustion machines that extend our, our power to extract virtually anything we want my, my question to you is, is, it seems to me that, that most of society would like to continue using science and technology to solve these problems. And I don't see how it's possible to use science and technology when they're at the root of our overshoot. Uh, so I'd, I'd just like your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective, but I do have a very different one than you in that context. I see science and technology as tools, just like a hammer and you, you can, or a match. I mean, you can use a match to light a fire to cook food. It took us a while to figure out how to cook food, but we ended up figuring it out. It's kind of an interesting story. Uh, so we wandered around with a little fire for the longest time because we couldn't create fire. Nature did only. Till we finally had the match. But you can also use a match to burn a house down. So, I mean, it's a tool. So science and engineering are tools. So it goes back to, I would argue, the earlier part of our discussion um, today, where it's consumption and the, the business model of business as usual, that our mindset is we must always have more, not replacement. Like we go to the grocery store, we always get some replacement food, but you probably occasionally buy something extra. Maybe it's because you just want to have something extra. That's all. But then maybe it becomes a common thing. You buy that extra thing. Is it kind of a sweet treat? So, I mean, we, we get sucked into a business model that we don't ever stop to think about. And I think that's the root cause of much of the problems we see today. And science and engineering and its processes has created by byproduct that is also not necessarily good, like the making of cement, for example, produces enormous amounts of CO2. And in the past, the making of steel produced all kinds of additional uh, nasty byproducts. But I don't think science, we can blame science and technology. We shouldn't have science and technology. It's how do we use science and technology? Well, I, I would agree with you there. Uh... Unfortunately, we generally use it to remove limits to growth, right? We use it to get the oil uh, out of the ground. We use it uh, to uh, genetically modify our uh, foodstuffs, and we use it to plow our fields and extract water from our underground aquifers. Uh, if we used science to understand how we can live sustainably on the earth, I'm all for it but we do not seem to use it in that way to any extent compared to removing limits to growth. Well, and as I said, it's, I, I think it's the business model and the scientists and the engineers who work in it are just part of that business model. Um, but they could apply that to doing what doing good, so to speak. It's, it's, well, it's, again, yeah. it's, it's just tools. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. Uh, and I would agree with you there. I mean, uh, econo I mean, basing our our economy on on a growth model uh, is is at the root of it just as well. I mean, thank you very much. Fundamentally, the problem is a social problem. 
right? I mean, it's a, it's a human, social, organizational, dynamic problem. Technology is there to help us or hurt us, but it's a social problem. It's our attitudes. It's our way we organize. It's our trade relationships. It's our political systems. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that makes it even more complicated, and that's one of the reasons it's probably got out of hand because we live in such a complicated environment with nobody in charge. Richard Van der Graaf, if I got that right, please <laughs> take the floor. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, okay, yeah. Well, okay, oh, so uh, my my point here, um, there, okay. So the, my point is for those, in rather than calling Chicken Little and we're going over the edge of the cliff, I think we all, all people who are in KCOR know that we're right now, the way things are headed, we're headed in the wrong direction which is why I started the What To Do group. And I would encourage all of those who are listening, who would like to do something concrete to reverse direction, to help reverse direction, to join the What To Do uh, group. You can sign up online as part of the KCORE group because we're trying to work out towards concrete actions that we can make a difference towards for the future. And again, for all of those who are listening, please sign up if you haven't already, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dieter Meissner, please, would you turn your video on and uh, your microphone on? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually joining uh, the very interesting, thank you very much, uh, discussion from Europe. Uh, I've been a professor in Estonia and I live in Austria, so I'm very much uh, European. Uh, my point is uh, directed uh, towards political action, because this is what is needed and uh, where actually the, the main hope of all Europeans in the moment is on the youth uh, movement uh, started um, quite a while ago already, but uh, still very active as Fridays for Future, as it's called here and supported by scientists as scientists for future uh, to give uh, uh, scientific standing to this movement actually. So we are all using uh, uh, lectures to support uh, the movement, which is very much concentrating of course on climate change. Now, my question concerns the uh, planetary boundaries you mentioned because uh, my fear, and this is why I still hesitate using uh, these graphs is, it may be scientifically correct. However, uh, it seems to me to detract a little bit from this focus of climate change. If you look at these diagrams you also showed, uh, you can even see that uh, climate change in the last uh, publications do not seem to be a major issue anymore. Other uh, climatary boundary or planetary boundaries seem to be more important than climate change. And I think here's a real danger because uh, there is now uh, uh, the knowledge that climate change is threatening mankind uh, became very common. Uh, among normal people. More than 80% uh, of Europeans agree that this is uh, a main issue. Now, detracting from this focal point, uh, I think uh, may even uh, lower the political activity and, and uh, enthusiasm uh, of people. So how do you see this uh, contradiction? Well, thank you for the uh, interesting question because uh, it is uh, it is a contradiction in many respects. But let me, uh, Dieter, uh, I, I guess uh, I'm not I'm not not sure how best to answer your question. Um, perhaps can I give a can I I'll give some, can I think a little bit more about it and come back to you? But uh, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll pause on that one and, and get, get, give you some further thought. But thank you very much for asking. Thank you. Uh, may I um, ask um, Walter Nittle, 
uh, if he would like to make the point uh, that he made in the chat just now. Uh, we're almost out of questions. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left. So, uh, and uh, oh, Phil Riley, I see you've got a, a, a question to ask. So Phil Riley, would you take the floor, please? And um, uh, Walter Nittle, if you're prepared to take the floor following Phil, please be ready to do that. Phil, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. The, uh, the presentation has stimulated many different parts of me. And I'm thinking particularly of the division of activity between scientists, academics, and the general public. My background comes more from the general public and the uptake of gardening by people who, because of the climate change and the COVID lockdown, have found that they had to become very much more involved in their lifestyle, their decisions, and a whole range of different things. So you know, some people haven't been employed so they haven't had the money to buy the stuff that they wanted to do but then it comes back to members of the public don't really have the experience of going out into the world where biodiversity is being impacted and understand their role in what is happening under their feet caused by them trampling on the the earth and consuming the goods that are there in limited supplies. How does an organization like KCOR begin to communicate those concerns to the people that are going to be most effective at communicating to their local decision makers and even up to corporate decision makers of what our needs are and not what your needs are? Is that a question you want me to try and answer? Or is it, a, I think it's more of a comment. It, it, it is, but to, given that you are with, within sort of the category of professionals that uh, have so many different answers, but yet then would people like myself want to get into the scientific information, I am roadblocked by pay-per-view journals where only academics or uh, 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 libraries can actually obtain the detailed information that would help me make better decisions. Well, then I I, I could uh, prescribe for you something, Phil, that uh, you might try if you haven't already. It's uh, at the beginning of a transformation of society. Uh, it's called Chat GPT. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> it's just it's a talk. It's a, uh, um, a, um, a chat bot. It's uh, like Wikipedia, but it's it's got all of Wikipedia in it, but a lot more. It's scanned the internet. It's been trained on trillions of bits of information. It is an encyclopedia. Right now, ChatGPT is simply a re repository of words, facts, numbers, formulas, formula symbols. And you can create almost anything that is in print, like comes with natural language. Um, and there are other applications that can turn words into music and turn words into art. But this is one that just is simply dealing with, you ask it a question, it will give you an answer. If you ask it and say, I'm a grade 12 student, it'll give you a grade 12 answer. You uh, say you're a PhD student, you'll get your formula. Uh, try it. it oh, yeah. It's not perfect, but uh, it's a good way to start learning all kinds of stuff. Uh, if uh, I could just absolutely amazing. If I could help out here too, that uh, under Bing search, if you go to um, uh, and use Bing as a search, you can sign up to use their version of Chat uh, uh, GPT. And uh, quite frankly, I've used it uh, a number of times, and it's just excellent. So it's something you can do now. Anyway, back to you, John. Well, I'll give a commercial uh, because we're on this topic. Tomorrow afternoon, well, our time, uh, I mean their time, it's Edmonton time, I'm giving a seminar on uh, what I'm calling 
the oh, the AI awakening. Um, the uh, and then disruption is running wild, something along those lines. This this chat GPT is. I mean, everybody from the Politburo in Beijing to the boardrooms of corporations around the world is shaking in their boots about this stuff. So that's a whole topic on its own, but I'm, I'm leading a discussion on that as a think tank in Edmonton tomorrow. Walter Nittle, would you like to take the floor, please? Yeah, um, I wasn't really... Sorry. Sorry, I'm following that. Uh, Claude? Uh, you would you like to follow Walter? Yeah, um, I, I just meant to leave a comment, but since I have the opportunity here, uh, there was this discussion about you know continual growth, and people are not don't want to accept uh, you know stopping of growth. Uh, so I think we need to really ask what do we mean by growth, right? Maybe maybe the, maybe the whole thing of limits to growth is a misnomer, misnomer until we define what growth means. Is it economic growth? Is it well-being growth? Okay, better. So maybe the whole term is, uh, you know, should be more like uh, limits to depletion or or or, or extraction or, or or something to that effect. Because I, you know, for me, I still want growth, but I definitely recognize that you can't. It's limiting because there are limited resources. So my comment was just basically about the term, you know, whether or not it's really the right term. Well, it, it's interesting, Walter, that, uh, you know, limits to growth, which is supposedly a definitive book at the time, has become a benchmark as 50 years later, um, as using the implication of the, you know, that they build more economy in its right. title. Exactly, yes. Because it was obviously kind of accepting, well, this is, uh, this is the kind of model we have, and there's some limits to it. But I think that was the main message. It wasn't saying that we got to change the model, but it was certainly thinking, it was certainly saying, I think we have to look at this model. And right. that's the one we continue to still promote. So we haven't really stepped back from it. And the only thing that saved us a little bit probably is the advancement of information communications technologies has reduced travel in some cases. It's, uh, you know, reduced the physical things to, op to, to, to uh, software things like software defined radios and things like that now. Right. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh, we're still in this business model of uh, more, more, more. Yes, yeah. That's all. So, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Claude uh, Butner, please. Oh, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I put some information in the chat. Um, uh, maybe I should explain. I, even though I'm not a banker, I follow what's happening uh, because I'm a, a discouraged World Federalist lifelong. And it, uh, the good news is that the G20 in 2016 was looking into what could be done. And uh, they had a green study group, which turned into the NGFS. I, I think the KCOR people remember me talking about this before. But uh, what I think is interesting, this is actually addressed specifically to Dieter's point, is that you know in Europe, we're doing things politically. What are you doing in North America? And um, recently, I think there was... Uh, an article, a National Observer, because I'm a member of KCOR, I subscribe to that. And Canada is struggling to go up to 2% of GDP to work on the climate. The uh, We're so proud of the, uh, the misnomer, the information, uh, Inflation um, uh, Act, or whatever the, the actual title is, uh, which represents uh, really 25% of where we should be. McKinsey and Company came out with a report last year. I put in a very useful link. Uh, it's tedious, but it has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, marketing um, illustrations to help the concepts come through. And, and so basically the, the World Bank's uh, supported by, and then it didn't get next to it, but way down at the bottom, there, I put in a link uh, that ironically, the chat helped me identify this week. I said, who is the consortium? Because I looked last year when these reports came out, I couldn't find the name of this it includes Potsdam and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that link actually tells you the members and uh, you know they're scattered around the world. So the um, economic modelers have been working with these central banks and central bank directors for the last five or six years, coming up with a plan that's pushed out by this giant 
a consulting firm, McKinsey, and they're doing it for their own. There's lots of money to be made on at the end of the world, by the way. Uh, so that's my cynical part, explaining to Didier why um, I don't think we're going to solve this because the evidence so far is that we are on a scenario that is very poorly uh, fleshed out in the NGFS website or McKinsey's. And, and uh, when they had these all these YouTubes explaining, hey, we've got this great plans and CEOs need to get on board and governments, uh, basically the... Um, uh, the conclusion is that uh, if we're not doing near 8%, you know, and maybe we're ramping up, maybe by uh, 2030 with enough catastrophes, we will be up to 8%. Um, but I'm afraid that a lot of the the uh, the wealth of all of our, these nations might be spent in what I'll call um, crowd control as things go haywire. And so uh, that's my comment. It's not really a question, but I, I welcome you, Peter. You, you seem to be very optimistic that uh, we haven't hit overshoot. Reese, Professor Dr. Reese has me convinced that we have, we're well into overshoot There's and it can't be stopped. Well, so, I, think we're, I think we are in overshoot or very near overshoot in several areas, uh, but I am, uh, but population wise, I don't think we're in overshoot, uh, but I'm, I'm being a, uh, an op, uh, being an optimistic realist, if I can put it in those terms with respect to population. Um, I mean, I, I, it's quite possible that, uh, you know, biology or nature will come and get us with a, a very serious uh, plague. Uh, and there's no reason that, that won't happen again. Uh, so uh, that that's uh, that's something that uh, maybe the, the forcing function when the when the limits get to the point that we're talking about here, <laughs> humanity pushing all of these natural limits, uh, that maybe uh, they'll just push back and knock us out. Uh, but uh, that's, yes, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm being, I am realistic about it. But I mean, this whole thing, I mean, otherwise I wouldn't do it. Because I'd just be giving up. And I should have started out, I found it very interesting. I will be sharing this, uh, the link to this presentation. I think that was a good summary, even if it's a simplicity, a, a, a simplistic models based on the tremendous complexity of the world system, it still helps the lay person understand uh, that these things interact. Yeah. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Rick Carpenter, would you like to take the floor? You have a point uh, that you made just now. I didn't alert you, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, the wisdom that has been uh, provoked by your talk Peter is a is a testament to what a good talk you've given us, and I suspect we could spend the whole afternoon uh, putting ideas forward. But I, the comment that I made was just simply uh, that, uh, far from detracting from science, the uh, overconsumption uh, that is causing the problems that uh, your talk has been dealing with probably stems from uh, our lack of security. And this is the irony of the situation that we find ourselves in. We are frail, uh, we, are, we do not have lives that go on, uh, and we would like to sustain ourselves um, in every possible way. And uh, for many of us, it is to have more of more. That gives us security. The fact is that that leads to our, uh, one of the gravest insecurities that we face as a species. Um, and I liked very much uh, that you uh, referenced uh, Mike Nickerson's uh, more fun, less stuff because embedded in that idea is that there are other things that um, can give us more security and they are not material. And I'm not ruling out the importance of material comfort in human life, but um, there are so many other things that can satisfy us. So that is just simply a point. And thank you so much for bringing this talk 
to us. Thank you very much for your comments, Rick. Uh, John Meyer, are you now able to join us for a, a closing remark here, please? Well, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay. They see something's gone right. Uh, great. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Peter. Uh, we tried to set up a uh, biophysical economics model using the uh, what if technology uh, approach uh, uh, system with uh, that were, was developed by uh, Rob Hoffman and, and Bert McGinnis. Uh, we were not able to come to any agreement with the uh, company which now exists, having uh, what if merged with another company. Do you know of another modeling system? In fact, are you aware of what if and their, their approach? Do you know of another modeling system which would uh, offer the capability of the, uh, the what if system uh, that could be used for a generalized uh, biophysical economics model? Well, I, it, it's for me to answer the question is very easy. I, I actually can't help you because <laughs> I can't answer that. Uh, but uh, I mean, there are obviously some colleagues like um, Derek uh, Ireland, Derek uh, Ireland, who I'm sure you've t you've talked to, um, but he might know. Okay, all you right, know well, Derek. If any, I, I don't want to drag this. Derek, up. Derek was a collaborator with Rob Hoffman, uh, so uh, Derek would maybe know. Uh, and I see Dave Harry's is uh, on the thread. He he might know too. Uh, Okay, Would you... right. that, that can be a subject for another time, but anyone who uh, uh, please contact me if they know of it, uh, we can do this offline. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I can't help you directly. Oh, that's great, thanks. Well, Art Hunter, are you there? Um, I, I would like to uh, uh, know if you're, uh, okay, no, I'm going to stop it. Look, folks, uh, we've had a wonderful hour and a half, uh, and it's time to wrap up the recorded part and uh, give some relief to our, our speaker. Uh, I would like, on behalf of all the participants here today, uh, and to those many more who will come and watch the YouTube of this in the in the in 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 the, over the coming days and in weeks, uh, for 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 coming. And uh, Peter, uh, you were warmly welcomed just a couple of speak people ago. Uh, Rick Carpenter and. Uh, Claude Butner uh, expressed thanks from the heart, which I'm sure you recognized. And I'd just like to extend that appreciation on behalf of KCOR itself, uh, our chair, who is not available today, and for the many people who will come uh, in the coming days and, and weeks. So I thank you very much. And the recording will now be closed. Uh, if you wish to uh, continue having a chat, we will continue for however long you wish. <laughs>